This is Lama Tantrapa. Welcome to The Secrets of Qigong Masters, the talk show brought to you by Academy of Qidao, the first and only school in the world offering professional education in Tai Chi and Qigong coaching. To find out about programs offered by Academy of Qidao and to learn how you too can become a certified Tai Chi or Qigong coach, please visit qigongcoaching.com. This show is also brought to you by the World Congress on Qigong, convening on June 19th through 21st in San Francisco, California. To find out more about the World Congress on Qigong and to register to participate in it, please go to qigongmasters.com. Today, I am delighted to reintroduce to you Dr. Raja Yanka, uh, the founder of uh, the International Institute of uh, Integral Tai Chi and Qigong, and uh, the renowned author of several books on Qigong and Tai Chi, including The Healer Within and The Healing Promise of Qi. Welcome to our show, Dr. Rajayanka. It's great to see you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Lama. I appreciate your time and your interest in our work and um, all you do. Well, and of course, uh, our listeners who have listened to the previous interviews with you uh, may be familiar with how you got started with the studying uh, energy arts and the oriental medicine. So perhaps instead of going into your background, you can share with us a little bit about uh, the arts that uh, we study, uh, Qigong in particular, and perhaps related disciplines. I know that you've been doing a lot of research on uh, the origins of these arts. Can you share with us a little bit about them? Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Lama. You know, there are so many ways to talk about these things because of the fact that there are so many famous origins uh, in China, you know, the great sacred mountains, the great um, philosophical disciplines of uh, Taoism and Buddhism and and then more recently, the influence of um, the modern world on China and uh, the Cultural Revolution and, you know, on and on and on. So there's many, many ways to describe the story, shall we say, of the origins of Qigong and Tai Chi. And what we now call Qigong probably existed in China maybe even 50,000 years ago during shamanic era. Uh, that time in China when, uh, you know, early humans were forming themselves into tribes and so forth, it's probably almost impossible to tell because writing didn't happen until maybe three or four or five thousand years ago, whereas human interaction began probably a hundred thousand years ago. And so we could ask the question, did those people have personal rituals that were associated with nature, that had something to do with um, uh, what we call the three treasures, the, 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 the body adjustment, let's do it all together, the body adjustment, lengthening, the breath adjustment, deepening, and the mind adjustment uh, centering on the present moment. And so uh, these three uh, points of focus, sometimes called the three mindful points of focus or the three intentful points of focus, are also known as the three treasures along with the sky and the ground and, and that which lies between. So, let me just sh show a few slides here. So, three treasures are considered to be, uh, in the Chinese language, some kind of science. Uh, the science of observation, observing the world, paying attention to what's around us, and even honoring and revering what's around us. The whole concept of Tai Chi is duality. And... Yet there is what is also called Wuji, which is that experience previous to duality. And um, so I think that people like myself and yourself are always in that quandary of 
shall we say, loving and appreciating and revering the oneness, but at the same time art, uh, articulating the work that we do in terms of uh, duality, which just happens to have the same name as Tai Chi. In fact, Tai Chi is named after the symbol uh, for duality. And so historically, if we investigate this, it's probably somewhere around 10,000 years ago uh, where uh, what you could call the systematic approach arose in human intelligence. We don't know that the systematic approach was a good idea. We only know that it happened. Uh, in Chinese medicine, we learn the three treasures of Jing, Qi, and Shen. Clearly, the ancients would have noticed that there was a sky above them, an earth below them, and biological interactions happening in between heaven and earth. And so the, uh, shall we say, the logic or the rationale or, or some of the foundations for how we think of and perceive relationship between the physical and the spiritual was something in the middle called the mind and emotions. We think about spirit being associated with the quantum and the transcendental elixir and the Tai Chi in the middle being associated with uh, resonance and the magnetic field and the heart-mind elixir and the physical being associated or the yin being associated with the body and the functional aspect of the body and the energy of the body, which we would call the ions, let's say, for instance. You know, there's so many different ways to look at these things. And then um, perhaps, you know, talk about it a little bit more or go on to your next thought. Why is it that you teach and why do you study uh, yourself uh, these arts of Tai Chi and Qigong? Mm, that's a good one. So uh, let's go to study by yourself and then we'll go to teach. And then we'll go to train teachers, which we'll talk about a little bit later again. Sure. So the concept for all of this has to do with what I like to refer to as cultivation. It's a classic word, shows up a lot in the Chinese language. And cultivation means something like growing a garden and starting with a rough plot of land and, uh, you know, tilling the soil and watching the uh, stars and the seasons and collecting seeds. Uh, in certain contexts, the whole concept of cultivation is based first on, on planting a seed or having a seed be planted. And we know that it's possible that we, we may have had certain seeds planted within us before we were born. And we have uh, certain seeds that have been planted within us since we've been born, and this, those seeds are sprouting, and we have the choice to be able to cultivate, you know, just like when you plant a, a, a row of any kind of uh, vegetable, like one of my favorites is kale and chard, so you plant a row of car, a chard, and then you uh, weed out the ones that don't seem they're doing very well, and then you cultivate and support the ones that are. Well, I am very focused personally for thousands of different reasons on the fact that, that cultivation of oneself is uh, a worthy pursuit. And so through, uh, you know, starting um, my, my first uh, meditation was uh, the Transcendental Meditation. I was actually initiated by the, that guy, the Maharishi, in 1963. And then I took my first yoga class, probably 1963 or 1964, had exposure to uh, Tai Chi and my first Tai Chi classes in 1967. And somehow, as a person who's fairly athletic, I was on the basketball team, I was on the swimming team, <laughs> I was on the golf team. I, I wish I would have known about Qi Gong when I was trying to play golf. Uh, rather, the, the ego playing golf is like, crazy. And so, uh, to me, Kung Fu, Tai Chi, Qi Gong, these are the disciplines that have appealed to me. And then when I found how appealing they were to me, 
as a doctor of oriental medicine or Chinese medicine with 30 years of clinical practice, I felt very motivated to support the people that I was treating in the clinic to uh, understand the power of this cultivation, the practice, and so forth. And so began teaching others and uh, writing some books about this. And the most interesting thing is that as I got further into Qigong and Tai Chi, I became less and less interested in giving treatments to people uh, because in my mind, a person who could heal themselves through the discipline of self-cultivation, who doesn't, is, is missing something. And of course, this gets into economics because a person spends money getting treatments that they could actually apply self-maximization and self-healing practices to themselves. And then as you can imagine, you know, once that kind of kicks in, you think, well, why not because there's not enough teachers, why not participate in the process of supporting people in becoming teachers? I still wonder if we could uncover the real reasons why you find the study of Qigong a worthwhile pursuit, or as you put it even more broadly, the self-cultivation, a worthy pursuit. Why is it a worthy pursuit? Why is it that millions of people who don't practice Qigong and Tai Chi, don't find it a worthy pursuit? Did they just did not think about it, or they considered it but didn't find it worthy? <laughs> Why is it that not everybody practices it? Well, because of the fact that this is a, a conversation that could be an entire uh, conversation between you and I, and because we want to stay on track for some of the things that we have planned on discussing here today, I'll just say very briefly that... The, the question, the question of who is who, like how did we get here, why are we here, all the biggest questions, to me, and this is a very personal view, and I don't want anyone to feel like that they should uh, share this view, I believe that there are people who come to this planet from different trajectories, and some people that are on this planet may have been here before. I, you know, I don't know. There's, there's not a lot of uh, really solid information on all this, but uh, some people may have been here before. Some people may not have been here before. Some people may have deserved or earned a certain level of experience, while others have uh, not deserved or earned different levels of experience. I don't believe in victims, I personally believe that people arrive in the experience of embodied consciousness um, through a process that uh, I don't understand, but I do believe in that process. And, and so why some people would be inherently uninterested, and as, as a Qigong teacher yourself, you know about this, uh, people come to your class, they say, wow, that was the most amazing thing I ever uh, experienced and then you never see them again. Like, what happened? So what happened? Yeah. And some people are disinclined because of fear. Some people are disinclined because they have horrible habits and they don't want to confront those horrible habits. Some people are disinclined for reasons that are buried in their, shall we say, their, their well, I'll just use the word karma or their destiny that we can't even understand. And some people say, well, if I was going to try to climb that mountain, I should have started a long time ago, so screw it, I'm not going to climb that mountain. Um, I, I don't know how some people do and some people don't. But what I do know is that you are, you drank the Kool-Aid, you're on the elixir, the, you're, you touched the hem of the garment, you felt the power, and instead of freaking you out or turning you away, you kept going. And it's the same with me. Uh, you know, I drank the Kool-Aid, I loved the elixir, I touched the hem of the garment, I was in the field of the great model energy of, you know, Buddha, Christ, Lao Tzu, all the greats. Uh, I was affected by that, it made sense to me. I was predisposed to the fact that it would make sense to me, and so I'm hooked. I'm in. I'm in deep. How do you motivate your students? Uh, by your personal 
uh, role modeling or you have some other ways to facilitate their interest and perhaps get them hooked? Well, I think the answer to that is that I don't. Um, I really don't. I am not inclined to try to get people to like something that they don't like. Um, you know, there's a beautiful phrase that says, I am a fisher of persons. You know, originally it's a, I am a fisher of men. I am a fisher of persons. I, I'm a person who fishes. I sort. I, I sift. I, I uh, select. Um, I'm a talent spotter. So for the people who do get it, I become, uh, shall we say, a counselor, a coach, a support person, an advocate, uh, because when it, when it looks like to me that a person has, uh, has the docking sites in their being for Qigong and Tai Chi, then I become very interested in them. And for the people who aren't, I'm, I'm less. I'm very much less interested in them, not because they aren't a child of God, and not because they aren't a brother and a sister in humanity, but that they seem to me, personally, just a personal view, to be on their own track. And it's not a track that I'm attracted to or interested in being involved with. And so when people leave my classes uh, as if, you know, they weren't interested, I'm usually of a mind to say something like, well, good, you know, now that person's not going to be around complaining to the other people here, whatever their complaint might be, but instead, the community of people who are retained within the community, shall we say, tend to be more interested and inclined. So I am disinclined to trying to um, get students to like Qigong and Tai Chi if they don't if they don't. I'm more inclined to support those who do in um, feeling like they're uh, you know, on the right track in their life and that kind of thing. I totally understand what you're saying and I uh, completely agree with this approach. My question was, how do you motivate your students? Not how do you motivate prospects to become your students. I understand you don't do that. But okay. how do you motivate your students so that they stay the course? Because one of the main reasons why more people don't practice Tai Chi is that all those thousands and hundreds of thousands of people who tried didn't stick around. <laughs> okay, here's the answer. I, I, I love the question, and the answer is this. It's a, it, it's a simple phrase. I'm not looking for students. I'm seeking colleagues. I work in a context of the democratization of Qigong and Tai Chi. So the concept for me isn't to find students. Uh, they start as students, but really in the final analysis, my, the core, the center, the heart of my work is to talent spot and find the people who are interested in Qigong and Tai Chi who would actually be inclined to become a part of how the world is a better place, not just by practicing themselves, and by the way, practicing by ourselves does work to make the world a better place, but um, for whatever reason, I am kind of destined to have a bigger view, and that view is to empower millions, and to empower millions, we train thousands, and so my students are, uh, the students of the Institute of Integral Qigong and Tai Chi are motivated by becoming colleagues and becoming a part of a community of professionals. Okay, so it's essentially they should be motivated themselves to be uh, the colleagues that they aspire to be. Now the question is, why is it that some of them master the internal arts and others don't? Uh, I, I really believe that that goes back to the destiny question that we already talked about, that some people are 
sort of predisposed to that by forces and um, influences that uh, come to bear on the whole process of uh, birth and rebirth. Uh, that the only thing that I can say is that a person who follows these things and uh, becomes deeply engaged in these things is predisposed and, um, and, and not likely to be changed by anything that I say or do. It sounds like being a Qigong and Tai Chi teacher is really a worthwhile endeavor. At least it seems like that to me. I wonder if... <laughs> Others agree with that. Perhaps you're familiar with some research has been done on this, or you have done some research and studies yourself. If so, would you share? In the modern world, unlike in the ancient world, where Qigong and Tai Chi were more like what we would call personal rituals, or with Tai Chi, actually a martial art, uh, it turns out that those uh, ritualistic and martial practices also have some kind of powerful uh, health-enhancing capacity. And there is, in fact, quite a bit of, what would you call it, uh, yeah, con contemporary research. The key word is the evidence base. In the, in the language of the modern world, applying Tai Chi and Qigong to health and uh, disease healing or disease prevention, the, the terms are... Um, is there an evidence base or show us the evidence base so um, I've been very involved in this actually so allow me to show you a project that is also pretty darn interesting at the beginning of any kind of endeavor or question around the subject of a particular modality whether it's a medical therapeutic modality or whether it's a wellness modality is to ask the question, is it safe and effective? Does it really and work? <laughs> yeah. And so this is the study that we worked on, myself and colleagues here at the Institute of Integral Qigong and Tai Chi. The evidence base equals safety and eff eff effectiveness. And that was published in, a, in a, uh, a journal called the American Journal of Health Promotion. American Journal of Health Promotion is a fairly highly credible medical and health-oriented journal, and the title is A Comprehensive Review of the Health Benefits of Qigong and Tai Chi. And one of our graduates is a researcher at the University of Arizona and uh, is a, a great and super intelligent person in regards to all of this, and she and others, including myself, went to the evidence base uh, and found 77 randomized controlled trials. So a randomized controlled trial is a, it's not just did you like this, but it compares with a con control group which answers the same questions and gives the same information and uh, uh, biological information if there isn't such information involved. And so these 77 randomized controlled trials were shall we say, from the point of view of science, pure or very, very highly uh, credible. And uh, so we found nine categories of influence, and the finding is that Tai Chi and Qigong are safe and effective. So let's just look at this just very quickly. So these nine outcomes, uh, immune function, neuropsychology, uh, patient reported outcomes means things like I felt better, Self-efficacy means that a person becomes more effective in taking care of themselves. Immune function and inflammation, your cardiopulmonary, which is the biggest killer, and then osteoporosis. So the point here is that 77 randomized controlled trials demonstrate the value of Qigong and Tai Chi, and that the top ones, which, you know, that's what typically you do in science, is that you look for, like, what's the most significant, shall we say. And to me, it's very significant that neuropsychological, which is uh, stress and extreme stress, like traumatic stress and anxiety and depression, all of those. And probably uh, insomnia. 
Tai Chi and Qigong have been found safe and effective for being utilized in these kinds of diagnostic areas. Mm. Now, to me, I think that everybody should do Qigong, but in the, in the medical world, anxiety and depression which, and insomnia, as you noted, are such big places where we expend money trying to help people uh, who could be helped by just taking better care of themselves. Same with falls, prevention and balance. And cardiovascular disease or heart attacks is the biggest killer and the most expensive thing that we treat in the world. It's Part interesting of that, that uh, when I operated my own clinic, the Portland Chigun Clinic, uh, the majority of clients coming uh, seeking help was perfectly in alignment with the statistical the number one reason why people seek medical help. That's the musculoskeletal pains. I'm surprised that uh, it's not included in these health outcomes. One of the other things that we were able to be in, come involved in was a project with the National Council on Aging about people feeling better and uh, sleeping better and all of that. But the, the most significant and interesting little bit here was that on the bottom, the percentages, that 2% of the people who said that they would repeat this class actually did not like being in this class. That people are interested enough in caring about their health that they'll actually return to and continue with a self-care practice 91% would. The practice accelerates these physiological mechanisms, which are uh, all associated with higher levels of function and higher levels of well-being, oxygen delivery and the uh, lymphatic system acceleration, relaxation response, neurotransmitter shifts, and enhanced immune function. But here's the really most exciting thing. Uh, many of the diseases we call heart disease or Parkinson's or diabetes, they are caused by system-wide perturbations of cellular process that are associated with the challenge of inflammatory process within the human body. Now that's why people get sick, but Qigong and Tai Chi, through their, the, the fact that they generate the relaxation response, are a part of how our genes can actually sustain their well-being, Qigong and Tai Chi, or also yoga, all the mind-body practices which trigger the relaxation response, support genes in sustaining their well-being, which has to do with telomeres, which, are the, um, which is the fuel or the DNA. So if a, if, a, if a cell reaches the point where it can no longer replicate itself, that cell will not be able to replicate itself. And imagine if you had enough of your liver cells or enough of your brain cells or enough of your heart cells that were no longer replicating, you know, what would happen to you? And so this is like, you know, the new fountain of youth, mind-body practice equals reduced rate of cell death. That's just amazing. It definitely yeah. is amazing. Now, so what are your thoughts on that? I would say that uh, longevity and immortality are interesting subjects. And people think that there must be some particular techniques for longevity, maybe even some techniques for immortality. But I would say it's not about trying to get the person to live another few years. Right. It's right. more about vitality, how you actually function at this particular moment in time and how you facilitate continuous function. And if you continuously function, well, then you are not likely to contract disease and you're not likely to get injured because people don't really die from old age, they die from disease or from injury or from uh, another cause of death, not just old age and they, they st stop multiplying the cells in their body. So, Correct. What we're doing is that we're learning how to facilitate greater vitality within ourselves and within people we work with. And yeah. it, longevity is a, a pleasant side effect of that. <laughs> in the modern parlance, in, in the way that this is described by people who are involved in the science of these things, 
the word longevity has been replaced by a new word called health span. Longevity in the modern world, in the Western world, is always going to mean just how long were you around. The important difference between lifespan, which can be uh, being alive in an extended context but, but not particularly being well, and health span, which is the span of healthy life or healthy longevity. Pretty interesting. Exactly. So, uh, Roger, would you share with us a little bit about the ways to become the Qigong teacher or Tai Chi teacher? I understand that you have expertise and uh, background in training others to become experts in Qigong and Tai Chi. How does one become an expert? And eventually, how does one become a Qigong master? Right, right. <laughs> That's a, you loaded up that question towards the end there. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll start with the end of the question. How does a person become a Qigong master? Um, I do not know. And I would say that the um, guideline that, that I would feel the most comfortable giving regarding a person achieving something that we could equate to mastery would be sustained focus and intent for a lifetime. To the extent that others feel that the person who has sustained focus and intent for a lifetime has something of value to share. And so uh, then, becoming a Qigong and Tai Chi teacher, to me that's a much different question, um, because a teacher isn't nece necessarily a master. A teacher is a person who has something to share. And uh, I know that we both use the word Qigong uh, or Tai Chi coach, which is coach is a prevalent uh, term in the modern world, and there's every kind of coach that there wasn't ever before. So we used to have basketball coaches and piano coaches and opera coaches, but now we have life coaches and health coaches and Qigong coaches and Tai Chi coaches, which is good. That, to me, the transformation of the human experience from one wherein humans do not trust themselves into another wherein humans do trust themselves requires coaches. I think coaches are much more important than doctors, uh, lawyers, uh, or, or psychotherapists, uh, sorry, psychotherapists. And um, coaches are people who support people in maximizing themselves at a pace that's reasonable in their lives and in a context where they are typically not um, shamed or embarrassed or blamed or, or any of the things that have to do with, uh, well, when I think back to my basketball coach, he used to, to shout at, um, you know, I mean, we were children at the time, 16 and 17 year old people. And of course, he couldn't help it because his dad shouted at him and his sergeant in the army shouted at him. So he thought like the only way to get people to perform is to shout at them. And I don't see that as being associated with coaching at all. So let's just say teacher or instructor or practice leader or coach. And in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in that range of all of those, with the master being something way above that, uh, I would say that there's the beginning level of, of uh, training to uh, advocate and support and teach others that would be a practice leader. A practice leader is somebody who has a little bit of knowledge over and above the level of knowledge that the people that they're teaching have. Then a teacher and an instructor, I would say, have a lot of knowledge over and above the, te the people that they're teaching and instructing. And then I would say that a trainer, that is someone who trains people to be teachers, that would be myself and yourself, um, are, you know, have more knowledge than just teachers and instructors. So I would say there's a gradient inspired citizens and enthusiastic people who practice Qigong, then into the range of teachers and practice leaders, there's the introductory beginning level of teaching and practicing called practice leader, sometimes called facilitator, uh, then teacher and instructor bump up, and then trainer of teachers and instructors is, is another 
bump up. So that would be my paradigm for the shape of all of that. Well, you um, mentioned um, that you also use the term coach. Where does the coach fit in this schema of things? <laughs> I'd be open to hearing your thought on this because you know I have a lot of respect for your idea on this l level. So how do you how do you stratify it? Well, I definitely agree that there are the masses of Qigong enthusiasts and Tai Chi enthusiasts who are often considered students uh, who are taking classes or participating in workshops, and some of them aspire to become instructors or teachers eventually. And so when they study with somebody, they basically uh, are aspiring teachers, and they may even begin to, to offer what they learned. So that basically what would be, uh, in your nomenclature, uh, the category of practice leaders. Now, there is a difference between teaching and coaching, and the difference is that at least from what I've studied about coaching and what I understand about teaching is that teaching entails downloading information into the student's mind, uh, giving certain example of how to perform certain functions. And if the student is a good student, well, then they will be able to perform in a way similar to the teacher's performance or replicate the knowledge that the teacher instilled in their mind Mm -hmm. in a way that's similar to what the teacher says. So essentially, that is different from what the coach does because the coach in, invites the student or coaching client, the person who is receiving coaching, to discover certain things within themselves and to develop their own authentic path along which they will be discovering uh, whatever they want to discover in this particular subject matter. And that path may be distinct from everybody else's path in this field, but essentially it creates authenticity. And as we were talking about the masters, I would say that the master is the person who is authentically masterful. And that means that they're not just trying to replicate what the teacher said or did. And they have easy time performing things that others have a hard time doing. Nice. I take that all in as a beautiful reflection of uh, the whole potential that is nourished and uh, cultivated by yourself, uh, myself, your colleagues, my colleagues, uh, the people who are involved in the National Qigong Association, who are also inclined to, um, you know, these ideals, shall we say. Uh, of course, everybody who's involved is going to be very focused on the idea of elevating the conversation to higher and higher levels of significance. So, uh, in the final analysis, everything that you said is uh, just excellent. So... I just invite us to take the next step in the conversation, given the fact that we've got a great mutuality uh, regarding this particular point. <laughs> Indeed. And I definitely appreciate the mutuality and, and want to invite our listeners to learn more about your methodology, because you have developed a methodology of transmitting the knowledge in a way that is distinct from a traditional mm -hmm. old-school teaching method. And True. this is what you present in, in your institute, right? True. And, and maybe it would be okay here to just mention the website and, and a couple of things. Of the fact that we do, we do these trainings, we train practice leaders, we train teachers and instructors. On, on, from, the, from our side, the, the, the concept is much more trending towards what I would call the coaching view as you just described a moment ago, as opposed to the, the mastery view, you know, which you also mentioned uh, uh, briefly. Excellent. And we will create a special link uh, and invite our listeners and viewers to check out uh, the Institute of Integral uh, Tai Chi and Qigong uh, following the link qigongcoaching.com slash iiqtc. Yeah, and let me make a comment about that, is that throughout the year, 
we almost always have something that's enrolling. And so by people going to that link and then going to our calendar or going to that link and going to any information about our trainings, we'll basically get them the information about what the next, like for instance, any time, now or any other time, there's typically something that's enrolling and something that will be enrolling and something that has just recently been enrolling. So um, all of those are going to be accessible to those who click that link that you just mentioned. Let me ask you, Roger, about uh, the program that trains individuals to become Qigong teachers. I know that you have one coming up uh, soon, and perhaps our viewers will be curious to find out about it. Uh, yes. Well, we, we do two trainings that fit the description of what you're describing. And one of them is um, what we call Tai Chi Easy. Tai Chi Easy is a 25-hour program. Now, it's possible that we might say, uh, how could you possibly learn anything about how to teach Tai Chi in 25 hours? And the answer is that there is an essence of Tai Chi, there is a set of principles of Tai Chi that are included in any kind of Tai Chi done well. And so what we've done is we've gone in a kind of an archetypal way to the great uh, uh, forms of, Qigong, of Tai Chi, the Yang, the Chen, the Wu, the Sun, and the Hao, and the, uh, also all the way to the original or the supposed or legendary original Wudong Mountain Tai Chi, and extracted from them in an integral sort of way the essence, shall we say, or the principles. And so when we teach Tai Chi easy, uh, we're teaching Tai Chi very much like as if it's Qigong, but using Tai Chi movements which include the great principles of sinking and rising, expanding, relaxing, breathing uh, in a relaxed sort of way, sometimes in a relationship with the movements, um, using the Tai Chi pole, the heaven and earth connection. All of that is uh, a part of that training program. And, um, uh, you know, and so it's amazing, and it happens in 25 hours. And that's what we've been doing a lot of that with the Veterans Administration, because in large institutions, hospitals, ins uh, health insurance companies, school systems, corporations, the Veterans Administration, you know, big uh, institutions with millions of participants, they don't really have any idea <clears throat> about how to manage traditional Tai Chi. It's just they can't tolerate it because it's too, well, it's too much. And so modified forms of Tai Chi are, are, are of great interest, and we believe that we've created a modified form of Tai Chi which is very, very re reverent and honors the original principles upon which Tai Chi is based, and I mean also the universal principles that we just described in the, with the Three Treasures and so forth. And so that's 25 hours. And then our teacher training is 200 hours. So think to yourself, you know, 25 hours, 200 hours, you know, there's a lot of difference there. And, and so we train people to teach Qigong, teach Tai Chi. Uh, we also train them in what we call alchemy, or what is called alchemy, or neigong, or uh, deeply focused internal practice, which also leads to the whole concept of immortality, which is the immortality really being the, the idea that, uh, not the idea of living forever in the body that you have today, I mean, not too many people are really interested in that, it's the idea of recognizing that we live eternally in some form or another and then taking refuge or cultivating the capacity to take refuge in the aspect of ourself that cannot get sick, is eternally well, 
and does not die. The, you know, the immortal self. So that, that's so much fun, so interesting, and, 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 and that's 200 hours. So those... And the, and All of the, that uh, is packaged into 200 hours program? Correct. That's amazing. How, how many hours per day do people take? Is it a program that people spend the entire 200 hours with you or it's spread out over the course of a year or several years or how does it work? Yeah, so it's spread out in three levels, the Qigong level, the Tai Chi level and the alchemy level. And in level two we review level one and in level three we, level, we review level one and level two. And they are seven days, uh, seven day retreats or intensives and then they're separated by a number of months. And so if a person wants to, they can go through the whole program in a year. Or if they would like to, they take level one and then come back, you know, uh, in another year. And then come back for level three in another year. And we don't insist that people finish level three before they can start teaching. So we encourage people to begin teaching, you know, right away with level one. What can they teach after the first level? Qigong. Uh, what is it in Qigong uh, that they can teach after the first level? You know, they can teach probably something like a form, or they focus on principles, or do they focus on meditation aspects of Qigong or, or yes. movement? Or what? Yes, all of the above. So, uh, you know, one of the definitions of Qigong and Tai Chi, as you probably know, is an operational definition which is associated with what we call four baskets of practice. Four baskets of practice. So body basket, breath basket, mind focus basket, and then self-applied massage, tapping, holding, stroking, you know, all that. So we teach people to be teachers by not exactly segmenting forms into the guideline. So the guideline is, isn't at the end of this training you'll be able to teach these forms. The guideline is that at the end of this training you'll understand Qigong and how to select different forms for different populations and in, certain, in, in a lot of cases based on the four baskets of practice which just imagine you go to a hospital and you say well I'm a Qigong teacher and they say well like what's that? And now you've got like a big long conversation to have. Now imagine you go to a hospital and you say, I'm a mind-body practice leader and I, I know you're interested in that. And then they say, fantastic, tell us more. Uh, what does it mean, mind-body practice? Well, there's four baskets of practice. There's some body practices. There's some breath practices. There's some meditation practices. There's some massage practice. And all of that can be woven so that it either is all happening at once, which is typical in Qigong, or that you can take the baskets of practice apart and do them as separate pieces. Because most people will say, uh, you know, just don't teach me the breathing, just teach me the movement, you know, or, or please, you know, I can't learn the movement while we're learning the breathing. And then this meditation thing is, you know, so we supply a way to be able to do the parts of Qigong as, as separated parts, knowing, of course, that they're never separate, that they're always unified, yeah. integral uh, set of practices all <laughs> one thing. That's funny because what you're describing right now, it's the opposite of integration. It's, it's uh, compartmentalization. Well, you said it, compartmentalization, segmentation, segmentation so you know, taking the whole apart, you know, supposedly the big, big power of Qigong is it leaves the whole whole rather than taking it apart. Right. <laughs> Remember that we don't have Chinese grandparents here. We come from a society that's like on another planet from the planet where Qigong comes from. And so what we have found, not, not what we believe, but what we have found at the Institute of Integral Qigong and Tai Chi is that people need help to uh, understand the, um, how they fit together.
And we come from a society that takes things apart all the time with the idea of trying to understand them. The problem with our society is that we, we never put them back together again. <laughs> well, uh, one of the baskets, at least one, maybe two baskets, actually uh, seem to be important that I would like to add to this uh, basket case. The basket case. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, when we talk about focusing on physical body, focusing on breathing, focusing on mental states or processes, focusing on massage or touch, something is really missing, and that is the essence of energy arts, focusing on energy. That would be specifically designated to focus attention on the energetic essence of things, I would say would need to be the central basket in, in this uh, collection of baskets, wouldn't you say? I would say so, absolutely. The energy infuses everything. So if, if, because it's not, shall we say, an activity, a physical activity class, and it's not a um, manage your emotions class, and it's not a spiritual class, it's all of those together. It's a physical activity, mind and emotions, mind-body-spirit process. Now what's at the center of that in the domain of Qigong, or actually at the heart of that, is the is the chi. So if I left it out somehow, I'm so glad that you put it in. And of course there is also the spiritual basket that uh, may not be as prevalent in the practices that can be done in hospitals or uh, VA uh, veteran administration uh, establishments, but it certainly is one of the key elements of Qigong. It's why people practice Qigong for thousands of years. I would say that the majority of schools of Qigong come from either Taoist or Buddhist or Confucianist or That's Tantric correct. roots. So how that works is, and you know this to be true because you've had the experience, I'm sure, is that when people practice Qigong, no matter who they are, they almost always have a spiritual experience. Well, the thing about it is that some people actually have some spiritual aspirations. And when they have an aspiration, for example, they have bodhicitta, which is an aspiration to experience enlightenment or a spiritual awakening. So when they come to me, and I ask them, why do you want to study with me? And they say, I want to experience enlightenment. Well, that's basically uh, an invitation to start digging into that basket where there are practices dedicated specifically to experiencing enlightenment or spiritual awakening. It's not that the person is going to be on the path to enlightenment that eventually maybe some years or decades down the road they will experience it. They actually start experiencing it from the get-go maybe in, in small increments, maybe in, not as deeply as uh, they would want to, but they sure. already start waking up. And so I would imagine that that's one of the main distinctions between the enthusiasts and masters in Tai Chi and especially in Qigong, is that the Qigong masters are a little bit more awake than the uh, average bear. Would yes. you say? What are the specific <clears throat> qualities that are distinctly uh, unique to Qigong masters that you would say? Yeah, I, I, no debate. It's, you're exactly correct. I would add one point, though, and that is that a person who uh, doesn't come to the practice for the sole purpose of enlightenment um, still has a lot of potential to have the experience of Qigong be a spiritual and an enlightening experience. Right. We are essentially facilitating the, the spiritually enlightening experiences almost by default, like we were talking about uh, exactly. <laughs> longevity yes. as a, a, a happenstance, it's a, a happy side effect of practice. Well, so we can also say that spiritual awakening happens as a result of a, yeah. a practice, even if we are not trying to awaken. Now, exactly. Very good. How about professional 
practice of being a Qigong or Tai Chi teacher. What is it that successful teachers do that others don't? So I'll just say that uh, on one part, I'll give two parts to this one. The first one is that on one part, the person is courageous and hardworking. So in other words, if they have a voice within them that says, I'm not doing this as well as I should, they will also tell that voice to shut up so that they can proceed with their intent, which is to help others. Uh, one of the definitions of a teacher is someone who knows more than the student. Not everything, just something, so that there's a gradient for the knowledge to, to go from the person who knows more to the person that knows less. In fact, some people know so much that they sort of freak students out because of the fact that they try to give too much. And one of the things that we say as a kind of mantra is how little can you give them means what small piece is each person ready to hear today. Most of the people who don't proceed as teachers are are not doing so because of, not because they're not well trained, not because they don't know enough, but because they don't believe in themselves. So that's piece one. And that would be about the psychology and self esteem of a person. So it's a the personal one, development issue. Yeah, personal development issue. And then the other one has to do with destiny. So, in other words, um, I, for instance, I'll just tell you about myself. In high school, I was really like a wallflower. I mean, shy. And, you know, so when I would go to like a school dance, it didn't really work that well for me. It was a kind of a depressing experience. If I would go to a party, for whatever reason, uh, it was hard for me to launch into a discussion, not only with women that I was attracted to, but anybody. How does this person like that become a teacher? Because obviously the level of self-esteem is fairly uh, compromised. And I think it has a lot to do with destiny. Um, some things happened. Uh, like uh, you've had this experience too, where you, you're on this trajectory, but then this one comes in. And I don't know where the the, the other one comes from. And it doesn't have to do with my goals, because my goals were over here. It doesn't have to do with my intentions. My intentions were this way. I was going this way. So something else shows up. And um, becoming a doctor of Chinese medicine showed up. Becoming Studying uh, regular medicine in pre-medical school and changing my mind you know, showed up circumstances. To me, circumstances are the hiding place of celestial influences. And um, we all have circumstances in our lives where we say, oh, I'm so sad. And then later in your life, you say, wow, I'm not sad about that at all. That was like the best thing that happened to me. But when it happened, it was like, you know, super distressing. So I think that personal development and Cultivating courage and hard work uh, separates those who succeed from those who do not. And then I think that there's also something inherent. Uh, like I was at the Esalen Institute this weekend, and there was a guy in the class, an architect, and um, quite uh, articulate and you know mature, and at that point in his life where you could see that he wasn't really that interested in his work. And I could see. This guy would be a fantastic teacher. I said, look, you, you, you'd you be a fantastic teacher. I can see, I can see that he would have an influence on a lot of people, be very entertaining, uh, foster and support a lot of personal transformation, but uh, it didn't have anything to do with his intentions or or his personal development, because he, he's got good personal development, but he just doesn't, he hasn't seen it yet. Well, in the sense you're describing that there are certain currents in the flow of life that flow in the ways that we don't expect, don't predict, yep. don't anticipate, 
sometimes aren't even ready to experience. And so the ability to sense the flow and to go with the flow or to stop resisting the flow at least and allow the flow to guide us in the ways that are most authentic and, and most natural for us, that becomes an art form in and of itself, isn't it? It does. That's basically my approach to Qigong. How would you describe Qigong? I describe it as the art of being in the flow, uh, which is the title of my book, The Art of Being in the Flow, uh, the one that uh, uh, I published a few years ago. How do you know that you are in the flow? You don't struggle against it. <laughs> First of all, you recognize that there is a flow of things and the flow of your life, and you detect that there are some changes happening, and that's the most constant thing in the universe. And if you stop fighting against the changes, stop fighting against the flow, and actually allow the flow to guide you where the flow is going, you may end up being where you need to be rather than where you want to be. Yeah. Now, yeah. what we want is often not the same as what we need, so we may even get what we wanted, but our needs aren't going to be met. That's why people say, be careful what you wish for. It's because you may actually get it. Good points. All good points. Uh, well, let me ask you one more question. Practices of Tai Chi and Qigong can transform the person's life. And some people are more ready for this kind of transformation and some are less ready. Would it be fair to say that the way to find out how ready people are and find out whether or not this type of path is something that they really resonate with is to try. Yeah, I think that probably that's the only answer. <laughs> so, in other words, you answered you you asked the question and you answered it. <laughs> well, I wanted to hear from you what your opinion is, and apparently you concur. Yeah, I concur completely. So, you know, as people are kind of moving through the flow of life, whether it's their essential uh, inherent flow or, or whether it's the flow of circumstances that carry them along um, without their knowledge of how the whole thing works, um, people are going to, some people are going to find their way into realm of Qigong and Tai Chi. I think the only way they can know is to try. I mean, there are people, I've had people say this to me, I saw some people doing Tai Chi on the beach, and I knew that I was destined to learn that and have that become an important part of my life. People have said that more than once. But usually I think people don't know, and they have to give it a go. And then it, it really matters who is their teacher. One of the things that I bump into a lot is a person who said, well, I tried Tai Chi and I hated it, but then when I came to this class, I liked it. <laughs> so, you know, what's the difference? And, of course, the difference is the style of the teaching, the environment, the, the, other, kind, the other people who are there. And we use this phrase, the democratization of Qigong and Qi and enlightenment is the whole idea that you don't become enlightened from another person. You become an enlightened person because you cultivate yourself. We call it self-actualization. It's yes, like, and, and, and it's in a context where you're not always being told what you should be doing, but more you're being encouraged to follow your heart and to awaken at a pace that is consistent with your essential nature, basically. Absolutely. Wonderful. I, well, I suppose this is a, an excellent point to conclude our interview today. And I really look forward to continuing this dialogue because it seems to have a lot of value to it. And I hope that our listeners thoroughly enjoyed it as well. Let yeah, me remind yeah. uh, that uh, you are watching the interview with uh, Dr. Roger Yanka on a talk show, The Secrets of Qigong Masters, brought to you by Academy of Chidao, the first and only school in the world offering professional education in Qigong and Tai Chi coaching. Please go to qigongcoaching.com to learn more about the programs and events offered by Academy of Chidao. And visit qigongcoaching.com slash IIQTC to find out about the programs and events offered by the Institute of Integral Tai Chi and Qigong. This show is also brought to you by the World Congress on Qigong, convening on June 19th through 21st 
in San Francisco, California. To find out more about the World Congress on Qigong and to register to participate in it, please go to qigongmasters.com. Thank you so much, Roger. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, my pleasure, Lama. We'll see you again and wish you well. Thank you.